The big business today, G20 special issue, is finally out on stands. And to talk about uh, the Prime Minister's interview on G20, where he spells out his vision for India's presidency and the legacy he hopes to leave uh, in the G20, I am joined here at the Business Today India at 100 uh, summit by my colleagues, Saurav Majumdar, editor of uh, Business Today, and uh, the managing editor of Business Today Television, Siddharth Zarabi. Saurav, Siddharth and I had the opportunity on the 21st of August to spend 40 plus minutes with the Prime Minister at his office at 7 Lok Kalyan Marg, where he expansively explained uh, his vision for India's G20 presidency. All that encapsulated in this uh, special issue of Business Today, which is now out on stands. And to talk a bit about uh, this interview and the interaction, sort of let me kick start with you. Uh, the fact that he doesn't see this as a routine presidency, he's not thinking of this as something uh, rotates among 20 countries. He's seeing this as the headline of the Business Today uh, special issue says, as being a catalyst for a new global order. So let's start by explaining to everyone watching at this time why the Prime Minister thinks that with India's G20 presidency, a new global world order will emerge. That's right, Rahul. Uh, if you remember what he told us that day, he sees this as an, as an important and an absolutely great opportunity for India to actually leave an indelible stamp of India on the world stage. Uh, it's because, you know, look at the catalyst's role which uh, India is playing by way of this G20 presidency. Look at the three or four key issues. Uh, reform of multilateral banks to be in line with the global priorities of today. Climate change and all of the other uh, priorities which emerging challenges, the pandemic, that's one. The reform of uh, multilateral banks. Uh, this whole point about inclusion of African Union, which he's passionately talking about as the voice and aspiration of the Global South. He wants India to be at the forefront of the, being the bridge between the Global South and the rest of the world. So these are the key things which will, in his hope, uh, you know, become the catalyst for a big, big new global order, which is an inclusive and prosperous new world. That's, that's the aim. That's the ambition he wants uh, India to be at the forefront of. See that. Spend a moment explaining to everyone watching your key impressions from the interaction with Prime Minister Modi where he spoke to business today about his presidency and the legacy he hopes to leave in the G20. Uh, all of us saw Rahul that uh, that was a supremely confident uh, Prime Minister and the only interview that he has done during this entire year on the G20 is with us so we are fortunate to talk about it. Let me draw a slightly longer arc to what the Prime Minister has said in this fantastic interview. If you look at how the world has changed, 2008 the global meltdown and the G20 was the key catalyst in the response at a global level, the most developed economies to try and get out of the trouble that the US mortgage crisis had brought upon the world. And now come to 2023, well over 15 years later, I attended the first uh, 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 of those G20s post the global financial meltdown and it was completely dominated by the developed world. And now the Prime Minister and during the course of this interview that's available, you will see question upon question, answer on answer which drives the narrative of how India is now proving to be a catalytic agent. And I think the, the fact that India has moved 15 years from 15 years ago from being a bit player in a global financial crisis to now being seen as the growth driver for all across the world is the biggest reflection. We are also talking in the 10th year of the uh, Modi Prime Ministership, uh, Rahul. And the second biggest thing that we can see is the decline of China. And uh, you'll have to read between the lines during the interview to get that message. but. There is a supreme confidence that the Prime Minister or the world's largest democracy is presenting through this interview to the rest of the world round. The other very important highlight of the Prime Minister's interview to Business Today magazine is his emphasis on digital public infrastructure and how the trinity that's been built up in terms of India's digital tech stack can be now a big Indian export two countries in Africa, two countries in South America and elsewhere, 
where they can benefit from the kind of seamless digital connectivity sort of India has been able to establish for one billion people. Absolutely, uh, Rahul. I think the digital public infrastructure which India has actually rolled out, and, and I must say that this is one of my favorite topics as well. We discussed it with him uh, in, in detail, and he was very, very excited about the kind of response the global uh, leaders are uh, you know, giving to the India stack. And this is truly an India stack. Look at it, the Aadhaar, Jandhan, uh, UPI, I mean, you've had uh, people for coming from the outside all over the world and just marveling at the way UPI works in India. And UPI is now, the, uh, the global world leaders are now taking, trying to take a piece of that and trying to replicate it in their uh, countries. So India is actually leading this whole digital transformation. Most importantly, Rahul, he sees this digital transformation and the India stack as being a key enabler to last mile uh, delivery of benefits for the poor. You know, if you see the Jandhan accounts and the whole uh, rollout of what has happened, it is the last mile delivery which this technology is going to allow and is allowing. And that's, that's critical for a country like ours and for the world at large. You know, the shadow of the Russia-Ukraine war hovers over uh, the leaders' summit which will happen in early September. And when we asked the Prime Minister about the challenges in building a global consensus when views on Russia-Ukraine are so polarized and divided, the Prime Minister actually seeks to take the attention away from geopolitics, saying that G20 is an economic forum. It was uh, brought about in the wake of an economic crisis, and he says that this isn't the only issue, and we'll see, Siddharth, a lot of that, where you want to elevate the conversation, talking about the challenges of the Global South, talking about bringing the African Union into the G20, talking about uh, reform of multilateral development banks, climate finance and various such issues, trying to take the attention away from contentious issues like Russia, Ukraine, to try and form consensus on issues where consensus is possible. In fact, uh, Russia, Ukraine, as far as the G20 concerned, is now an event in the past. You will see while it may kind of impact uh, a consensus statement which is usually done for such multilateral uh, 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 events. But the broader point, and you mentioned uh, the African Union, India drove the inclusion of the African Union member states in the BRICS. That's already happened. So even if the G20, you know, the, the caucus within the G20, there's a smaller caucus of states, even if they don't let things happen, it's already happening. The Global South is together. And that's already been driven by India. I'll come back to a, a point to try and answer the question, Rahul, that you posed to me. The Manmohan Singh Prime Ministership at global forums like the G20 and elsewhere was characterized by immense respect for the persona of the then Prime Minister as an economist who could speak a global economic language. Look at the present. Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaks in a very different, very confident, rising India, ambitious India, aspirational India, new India language. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh spent a lot of his political capital, whatever he had, on a India-US nuclear partnership. Not much came of it, you know that more than anyone else. But now, the India is exporting technology. 47% of uh, our payments are happening digitally. We are already exporting UPI to well over a dozen countries and that number will go up exponentially. The fundamentals have changed and I would say if you were to go back even further, the time when we joined the WTO, we were co-terminus with the developed world. China delayed that, it advanced its economy in a different format. Throughout the interview and the uh, conversation, you know, uh, uh, that I could sense was that the Prime Minister is preparing us for the next round beyond Atman Nirbhar Bharat. What it will be, we'll have to wait for him to tell us you some know, other time. The Prime Minister said he hopes that India becomes a Vishwamitra, a friend to the world. And he said he'll expand on his concept of Vishwamitra, which he highlighted during the Independence Day address, and build on it in time to come. And one of the key aspects of the G20 presidency is to try and give the African Union 
membership status in the G20. It's an idea that's already received in principle approval. He hopes to push it through uh, during the leaders' summit in September. And sort of when we spoke to the Prime Minister about the African Union, he links this to the idea of Vasudev Kutubakam, uh, the world is one family. And in that sense, he's trying to provide leadership to the global south. And here's something that he thinks if it goes through, is a tangible takeaway. Because when history looks back at when the African Union became a part of the G20, all of Africa will remember that it was India and Prime Minister Modi that made this happen. Very true, Rahul. And that is exactly what he's told us. You know, he's talking about Vasudeva Kutumbakam. He says, if developing nations are not part of this whole journey towards prosperity, a, a prosperous global world, how can we talk about Vasudeva Kutumbakam? And he wants to leave that. That's where I say it is India's indelible mark this year as a G20 president that you need to take everybody along. Leave no one behind in a broader sense uh, beyond the SDGs. You, you know, you're talking about every other country, developed nations, developing nations moving towards uh, prosperity in harmony. That's what he wants to leave as the legacy of this G20 presidency, Rahul. You know, the other very interesting highlight from my perspective was the fact that Prime Minister Modi doesn't see India as being in competition with China. He doesn't see this as India versus China. While, of course, uh, there is an ongoing uh, border confrontation with China and some attempts to dial back have been made, he actually sees India and China as being able to coexist, possibly not as best friends, but not necessarily as sworn enemies either. And in that construct, uh, Siddharth, he's trying to ensure that India's position goes from a middle power, say the ninth biggest economy in the world, to within his tenure at least becoming the third largest economy in the world, thereby signaling a once-in-a-lifetime shift in global real politic uh, power equations. There is absolutely no doubt that India will be the third largest economy very soon. You could sort of quibble about uh, the few months. Ray Dalio, one of the most famed investors in the world and I would encourage uh, uh, viewers to go out on his tweet uh, stack and go and see what he has said practically hours uh, ago about India. Let me try and answer it from the point of view of China and Rahul, you were absolutely spot on. We have seen some hints of uh, a different language emerge in the last few days itself. Chinese growth and the current economic model, one of the key things that really worked for them was the real estate sector. Uh, go through the headlines and the fine print of uh, what's happening in the Chinese economy and its real estate sector. And I'm not even drawing parallels, mind you, with 2008 US uh, uh, depression that also got triggered from real estate. So let's leave that aside. In India, all of our viewers will acknowledge what's happening to the real estate sector. Phenomenal increase in prices. In fact, at the upper end, houses are becoming unaffordable. The point is that we are clearly within grasp of number three. There are issues about the quality of growth, the K-shaped growth curve that we are seeing right now and what needs to be done to fix that. But at the macro level, it's very, very clear. India's growth story, God forbid anything else again like COVID, is completely on track. Is it a bullet train? Yeah. Is it a, a, a Vande Bharat? That's a matter of debate, Rahul. The Prime Minister spoke in this interview about the need to reform multilateral development banks. Sort of spend a moment explaining to everyone watching what is the specific reform India is seeking? How do we hope to reform multilateral development banks and the existing global trade order? Uh, Rahul, if you remember what the Prime Minister said and what we already know from the G20 deliberations which have happened, the multilateral de uh, development banks need to really rethink themselves in terms of how they are able to increasingly finance a new developing and challenging world order. For instance, if you look at the SDG requirements, if you look at the climate change requirements, there's trillions of dollars which are required in terms of lending uh, abilities of the MDBs. Now, if you 
you do not understand and if the, the MDBs do not, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, change their whole structure and their whole way of approaching finances. We also had uh, earlier a, con a conversation with KV Kamat where he also stressed the need to do that. And there is already, remember, in this Indian presidency, we've also set up a working group uh, which, which, where Mr. N.K. Singh is the co-chairperson. So there, he, they've submitted one report, the second report is coming. We will await what, what comes out of those reports. But it is a very important move because that, Mr. Modi himself said, that needs to really, um, M M you know, MDBs need to change themselves to look at new challenges like pan the pandemic and the, uh, the climate financing and the rest of the lot. Okay, I don't want to go on because that would take the juice out of the Prime Minister's interview. There's a lot that he's spoken about in this uh, special issue of business today where we really try and give an intellectual framework to the G20 conversation. So many different events in different parts of the country. But the most important question, what is likely to emerge from them? What is the agenda that India is pushing? Where are we on different aspects of the G20 agendas? All that covered by the Business Today team in this special issue. And you can read the Prime Minister's analysis on what he hopes will be India's legacy as the president of the G20 uh, in the special issue of Business Today which is out across the uh, Business Today multiverse right now. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.